the international comparisons, not just the comparisons between the situation of the UK government and Scotland, but also the UK and the rest of the world. I'd, I'd be really delving into what's happening in South Korea. But I really wanted to start with um, sort of your tweets, really, because I think there's a lot of people that really responded quite well to them. And I wanted you to sort of expand on the, the tweet you did last week, um, which says, uh, not implying criticism, but review of management of Corona crisis by UK, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland governments will be required, should span everything from testing to distancing strategies, government transparency to economic response. Could you just expand on, on what you were getting out there? OK, well, as you will know, Robert, since this first came to light uh, and since the UK government in particular started to say we are developing a strategy for dealing with this, the strategy has changed. Uh, and the strategy has often included targets that have come to play and have then been dispensed with a few days later. So in one sense, understandably, because of the unknown nature of this virus, things have had, had to be changed as we go along. But as you will know from your own research into other countries, different countries have approached this in different ways and potentially with different consequences. So I think we need to look at that. The other thing that I'm interested in is the effect that the devolved settlement has had across the four different nations and the way in which they have been, in one sense, cooperating together, but how far does that mean that the constrained administration, say in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, have been a bit overly constrained about the way in which they can take matters forward. So, uh, yeah, so I think there is always the need to evaluate things, but I think in this case there's a particular need to have a very thorough review of matters. Uh, uh, and that should ideally have started now, gathering day by day uh, what is the information we are dealing with, what are the decisions that we are making, so that they can be properly reviewed in time. Yeah, I think what's what's quite interesting is a lot of people are coming out with remarks about what happens if the, the curve is flattened quickly in Scotland or relatively quicker compared to the UK, you know, the potential of, of differences between, say, London, the rest of England, Scotland, the differences between uh, somewhere like uh, Angus, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and, and sort of the, the way room for the, the Scottish government with regards to that. I mean, you might have a situation where the, the curve is, is flattened considerably in Scotland, but you have a continued spike um, in London. And I'm just wondering what you think is the right way to go forward or what politically the Scottish government can do. Well, the first thing I would say is we've got to be very cautious at this early stage of drawing any such interpretations. I mean, uh, over the last five or six days in particular, there has been a noticeable uh, uh, increase, escalation in the rate of deaths across all four countries. Right? So the, what we don't know is how far uh, any one country in the UK will be behind another country in terms of the place in the in the in the the, the graph, the bell curve as it's called. So, we don't, so we've don't. got to be cautious because we need some time yet before we see where everybody has been relative to one another in terms of this graph. Uh, the acceleration, for example, in the last, last few days in Scotland has been pretty steep. But we don't know if that is just uh, a, a, a trend that is unique for these few days or whether it's going to come down again or, or what. So it, you need to look at these things over a period, I would say over a period of a good two or three weeks, looking at it day by day before you can begin to become a bit more confident in what's going to happen. And of course, the, de the death rate were very low until comparatively recently. So we're only getting to that I think early part of the acceleration in the curve, uh, I don't think we are likely to be anywhere near the peak as yet. Then you ask a very interesting question of, about flattening. Flattening can happen in a number of ways. What you hope is that the peak is flattened considerably, of course, 
But then what you want to have happen is after that peak, whenever it is, you want to try and get a steeper fall off afterwards so that the overall number of people who die, for example, is itself significantly reduced. And that's the intention. It is quite possible, of course, to get a flattening, but it doesn't fall quickly thereafter. But it, it just spreads the amount of deaths over many more months. And that, of course, is something we want to avoid. So we've got the question of we want to try and flatten as early as possible so that we don't reach a high peak. But we then want to get the, the, a, a significant decline to happen thereafter. And we are not near understanding where we are placed at the moment. But I suspect if you look at the measures that are taking to try and prevent the, 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 or to flatten the curve at the moment, I suspect it's going to be many, many weeks of this social distancing, possibly months, that we're going to have to practice to really drive down the total number of deaths ultimately. Do you think there's a the way to sort of break out of this sort of locked up, lockdown situation, especially when you look at, for example, sort of the pillars by which South Korea has dealt with this? Um, initially, you're looking at mass indiscriminate testing. Then you've got contact tracing, the idea of if anyone's come into contact with anyone who has been um, tested and found with having um, the, the COVID-19, that they are to be quarantined immediately, which is a third pillar. I mean, do you think we're just so far gone in missing the ship here that there's no point reverting to a mass in indiscriminate testing? We just simply have to follow through now with this social distancing for, for months and months, however long it takes. Well, first of all, let me say something about South Korea, because I think you raise a really interesting example there. Uh, because I think there's politics in this as well. Now, here's my take on what the politics in South Korea are. If I remember correctly, South Korea uh, had a particular experience with the Ebola, uh, 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 much more severe than some other countries. And that raised the sense in that country of people wanting governments to intervene and do things. So the first thing I would say is that in the very early stages, when things started to become apparent of what was happening in China, you had a population in South Korea that was much more up for pressing its government to make sure it acted quickly, something that did not happen in the UK. Right? So the population in the UK was not pressing for a, 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 what some people would call extreme measures a, early enough. Now, I say early enough. If I take my own individual case, and I, like any other individual, could be wrong here, but my concerns were such that I started to practice self-isolation and social distancing probably more than a week before the governments were asking the population to do so, simply because I was a bit concerned that we were not acting fast enough, right? In my personal view, you needed to act strongly before the acceleration took place. Whereas we're in a situation today, we're talking about getting to a situation of, of having a lot more testing capability by the end of April. But that might be over the peak. Rather than looking towards saying, in my view, having effective testing and I know there's an argument about what that means, but having effective testing as early as possible. So I think there's that. I think, secondly, what you said about the type of tracing that's done in South Korea is very interesting, but I doubt if we could be able to do it the same here in our kind of democracy, because, as you will know there, it, it involved tracing everybody's phone. They had apps mm -hmm. that were able to trace and things like that. And, and whether people would be willing to tolerate that in our society, I'm not quite so sure. You know? So well, I suppose, I suppose, this, I suppose this, this issue, though, isn't it? It's a kind of people are bringing back, coming back to these themes of 
of the choice between liberal democracy and authoritarianism is that oh. a false place, especially with the rise of technology. I mean, that you could argue that South Korea is certainly not all the way down the road similar to China, but it's still got a very effective society, a very effective civil society. Um, and South Koreans like things to be very conven very convenient, <laughs> you know. Um, so maybe, I mean, maybe this is part of the sort of the global trend towards a more assertive, centralised, technologically capable governments. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very interesting to see in the way in which this is going to play out. I wonder if we could be doing more in terms of using technology and the like in the midst of this crisis to keep people more in contact with one another, to have the type of flow of information that I think would be useful for a lot of people. But uh, uh, but you do, you do get into this debate. I mean, look at the debate that's happened in Scotland over the last few days about the initial proposal to do away temporarily with jury trials. Couldn't possibly do that. This has been a cornerstone of our society for centuries. And so uh, there's that. Now, I have sympathy for that argument, but it needs to be set alongside the needs of a crisis. And how far are people willing to compromise their historic rights for the sake of dealing with an immediate crisis is a very real debate and a, a quite a proper debate to have. You know? And what, what do you say to, to people who, um, again, you know, cause just because we're in the middle of a crisis doesn't mean that, that politics stops. You know, people arguing that uh, what we're seeing with the NHS um, and the government, you know, asking private companies to, to step in because of, you know, some would say uh, underfunding or 10 years worth of austerity, that you're going to start to see not the consolidation of the state or the, or the refunding of the NHS, um, regardless on either side of the border, but what you're going to start to see is more private um, involvement or corporate involvement in the NHS via the, the back door. I mean, what's your view on that? Uh, well, the way uh, I think that's an open question, a perfectly reasonable question to ask, but I don't think we can draw any conclusions because of what has been happening over the last few weeks in this crisis. I would put it slightly differently. At the beginning of this crisis, when we were becoming more aware of things in January and the like, and when the UK government in particular started to speak about it, it seemed to me that there was a tendency for the UK government to want to centralise as much as possible, including testing, having a very small number of existing labs that were there to do testing. And what you find has been happening in very recent times is recognising you never, we, we don't have the capacity to do mass testing. And so they're having now to create many more labs. So that's why you've had in the last few days the announcement of the Glasgow University and uh, lots of other institutions, uh, uh, including some in the private sector, making available their facilities to, uh, uh, to do things. But I think personally a mistake was made very early on when there was not a sufficient look at the capacity issues. Are we going, what are we doing to make sure we have got the capacity for testing in this country? And it's been rather late, in my view, in recognising that there are fundamental capacity issues.